as believers, we must be willing to deal with faulty foundations in our lives, whether as personal, whether in your personal life, whether in family, extended family, whether in the cultural roots you have, whether racia, whatever, every faulty foundation to the extent that you discover it or is revealed to you by Holy Spirit, you have a duty to respond when he says in the book of uh, um, Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? It is important. Never ignore faulty foundations on which you stand. And so, brothers and sisters, do something. What are your foundations? Is there blood guiltiness in your foundation? Is there murder? What is it? Is there, you know, taking things from people against their will? And they are part of your heritage. You need to come to a place where you renounce at the least. And if you can, engage in representational repentance. And above all things, make sure that none of it is found in you. You don't eat the fruit of evil and expect to be guilt, guiltless before the Lord. So dealing with faulty foundations is important. Why the Lord is saying this is that today, the Lord wants to address the Protestant movement, which supposedly came out of Rome, but carrying the very baggage of Rome, even on stereotypes in some cases. So apostasies, heresies, errors, and the pseudo-gospel, lesson eight, is Protestant version of mystery Babylon. Let us pray. Father, just have your way and reveal to us by your spirit things we need to understand, things we need to come out of, things we need to renounce, things we need to ensure that no leaven of them is found in our lives. Lord, just have your way by your spirit. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, the uniform testimony of the Protestant movement shows a dark side which is often overlooked. And that dark side is that the DNA of Rome was inherited and has been sustained over the years, leading to a systemic falling away. When we say systemic, we mean it's now like inherently part of the entire structure not to be in the truth of the Holy Scriptures. This falling away has been so normalized that many take it for granted that as long as apostasies, heresies, errors, and the pseudo-gospel work in terms of gather crowd, in terms of generate money, in terms of little building or big, big buildings and assets, as long as they produce results, there is no need to bother about how healthy the roots are. Men and brethren, this utilitarian perspective of the gospel, when we say something is utilitarian, meaning that, you know, the end justifies the means, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. Just get the money. It doesn't matter what you engage in. Just get the money. And then we can talk about that later. This utilitarian at, as, uh, approach, this cavalier you know, non challenge it towards the roots of the gospel is so terrible before the Lord that the Lord wants to help us today. Because it makes of none effect the Holy Scriptures as a revelation of the immutable counsel of Elohim and compass of life. If you believe the Holy Scriptures is the immutable counsel of Elohim and the compass of life, then how can you be involved in something that is so unbiblical, so extra biblical to the point where it is no longer, you know, I mean, less than brothers and sisters, how can somebody be involved in something? You do it as a normal thing, and yet it is contrary to the Holy Scriptures and you don't bother. Something is wrong. In this lesson, we explore the faulty foundation of the Protestant movement and trace the DNA of Rome it did not deal with, but rather built upon to create the religious equivalent of the Tower of Babel, which is what you see today. The Protestant movement is a religious equivalent of the Tower of Babel. That Protestantism is you. Go to any city. Go to any city today. Go to any country and try to bring Protestants together. We'll talk about that later. So at this stage, it is safe to ask, 
that only those who are interested in the truth should continue in this lesson. If you want to know what will challenge you, if you want to know what will challenge you to get it right, because something has happened that is so terrible that people can be in a system that is decidedly contrary to the Holy Scriptures, contrary to what the Holy Spirit says, and they don't bother, then that means we are in for a very terrible situation. Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them. It's not just enough to talk about them or confess them. It must be forsaken because such a person shall have mercy. So let's go to the beginning of the Protestant movement. On October 31, 1517, a Catholic priest, Martin Luther, nailed his 95 theses at the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. It was basically a challenge to some, not all, of Catholic belief systems. In those days, if you want to dispute something, you develop a thesis and, and put it out so that people can come to debate you. So basically, that was what he was doing. He did not intend to leave the Catholic Church. Take note of that. He wanted to challenge and possibly change some doctrines and dogmas that were considered offensive and non-biblical. Yesterday, we gave a list of some of them. The previous time, so if you look at lesson 6 and 7, you get a big understanding of what Martin Luther felt, you know, repelled by, which led him to repent. Before then, before that 95 theses were uh, nailed, you know, in 2017, we joined a company of apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists from across the world, South America, North America, Europe, to converge and, uh, you know, at uh, Wittenberg for the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's uh, 95 Thesis. It is important to know that before then, the man was frustrated that various works of religiosity did not bring him closer to God. He was a priest. He would wear black cassock. He would walk barefooted. All he was trying to do was to see how to be closer to God. He, he had a love of God. You know what? That desire, even though he was doing it wrongly, the Lord saw his desire and he had an epiphany of a scripture, Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yeshua, the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The verse 17 is what he caught a revelation of. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Wow! So all these works he's been trying were meaningless. We're not producing fruit. He was not getting any closer to God. He said, he just shall live by faith. In other words, this thing is by grace and you get it by faith. And the Lord opened his eyes and he was saved. His discovery that righteousness is attained by grace through faith and not through various works of religious labor was so impactful that he felt a compulsion to challenge some dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, which he found unhelpful. Hence, he compiled the 95 Theses to dispute. And it will be important for you as students of the Bible, go to Google and just put the 95 Theses, you get the document so that you can read them. The way he put it in a, in a way that people can come to debate with him some of the things he found offensive. Men and brethren, the Roman Catholic establishment was not about to shift its, you know, its to his demand. It was not about to, because he's established. He's worked for them for years, from the 4th century to 1517, um, uh, uh, was at least 11 centuries when Rome ruled the world. No other person, you didn't have access to the gospel, to the Bible, you didn't know the Bible, what you need is what the priest told you. 1700 years, they were not about to throw it and submit to him, 
You know what happened? They convened the Diet. The Diet is a supreme meeting where religious authorities and some of the theologians gather. So at the Diet of Worms, presided over by Pope Leo the Tenth, you know, and you know the reigning emperor then Martin Luther was summoned and asked to renounce his views or be expelled from the church. Unwilling to back down, this man was bold. Martin Luther alone. A whole council was filled with the biggest personalities in the entire Roman Empire. And at that diet of worms, men and brethren, Martin Luther stood his ground. And he's standing his ground. He didn't back down. And he was expelled from the Catholic Church. He wasn't doing his reformation to go out of the church. He wanted the church to change, and the church said, no, we are fixed. You are the one. You are a heretic. And men and brethren. So what happened? He refused to renounce. He was expelled. The die was cast, and he was permanently separated from Rome. This became the foundation of the Protestant movement. Protestantism is therefore a separation from Rome based not on the rejection of the totality of what Rome stood for, but disagreement over specific provisions of Roman doctrine and dogma. Things like infant baptism, things that are righteousness by works, things like infallibility or papal authority, things like the dogma of indulgence, whereby if you have a relative or friend that dies, you can, you who are alive, can do some rituals, mass for, pay some money for, and when you pay that money, that person can come out of, from instead of hell, going to purgatory. And after some time, his sins are washed away. Person who is that, you know, the Bible says, upon the other man wants to die after that, the judgment. As a matter of fact, you know, St. Peter's Basilica, the original one, was built largely from the funds collected by indulgences across Europe. One of the ones that scandalized Martin Luther Extraordinary was a man called Johannes Teschel. He said he preached his sermon. You know, he went about the empire raising money. He said, listen, if you put your money in for indulgence, uh, before your money touches the base of the offering basket, so will your relative jump from hell to purgatory. You know, and that is scandalized Martin Luther. He was the biggest fundraiser of his days, fundraising in the church didn't start today, men and brethren. So let's, let's look at some of the various aspects of the DNA of Protestantism so that we can know that it wasn't much different from Rome. So, brothers and sisters, in Revelation 17, there's something that the Lord said that we need to take a note of, especially verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This description showed that mystery Babylon that John was shown in Revelation 17 was not about one church or entity. It was going to be the mother of a harlot system that would take people away. People will have a form of godliness, but they will deny their power, the power of righteousness, the power of holiness, the power of transformation, the power of discipleship. One will be engaged in churchianity, but not any near Elohim. Men and brethren, let's look at some of the specific features. Men and brethren, let's look at them. Number one, union of church and state. Martin Luther did not renounce that. As a matter of fact, he embraced that. In the ensuring crisis with Rome, when Martin Luther left, he sought help from Frederick the Third, the Elector of Saxony, according to Britannia.com, Britannica.com, the online resource hub. It was while Luther was protected in the Wartburg Palace of this Frederick Third that he translated the Bible into German. So a cornerstone of his achievement was under the protection of the state. In Geneva, John Calvin, if one of the fathers of Protestantism, united church and state, and it became one in Geneva. Uh, men and brethren, you need to look at Vlieb 
dot l u e dot i t. What of England? The crown jewel of Protestantism was England under King Henry VIII. Something interesting happened because Pope Clement did not give him the annulment he sought. He created a new church system where the King of England, the Monarch of England, is the head of the church, and church and state are one. This is true. So, at foundation of the Protestant movement was the uncanny embrace of union of church and state, just like the Roman Catholic Church. So, it's a, it's a case of Keto calling Port Black when Protestants, you know, they love to bash Rome. They love to bash Rome. Men and brethren, let's be honest to ourselves. These things we need to. Number two, replacement theology. We saw yesterday. That starting from the early church fathers like Arianus, like Augustine of Hippo, like Clement, and like John Christostom, who bashed the Jews, David Lazarus, who wrote in israeltoday.co.il, that anti Jewish theology is also found in almost all streets of the Protestantism, beginning with Martin Luther himself and his anti-Semitic rhetoric during the latter years of his ministry, frustrated that only a small amount of Jews were converted after years of his preaching the Bible and the Reformation, he finally ordered the persecution of Jews and justified these atrocities in the sermons and writings which influenced future of Protestant generations. That's what David Lazarus observed in israeltoday.co.il. Men and brethren, he observes that the poison of replacement theology is still working in many Protestant denominations. Men and brethren, listen to this. It is believed by many that a booklet Martin Rutter wrote when he was quite, you know, getting towards the end of his ministry, the, the, the title was Jews and Their Lies. He laid, that book laid the foundation, we believe, of anti-Semitism in Europe. And if you want to see, it's a, beautiful, it's a document you need to read to say, wow, this is the man who wrote, who rediscovers salvation by grace through faith. You need to go to jewishvirtuallibrary.org, quoting internet medieval sources from Luther's work, volume 47. You need to read it. It is pure vitriol, men and brethren. So Luther basically... What later led to Jews being unsafe in most European cities and then suffer what they suffered in the 19th century and the earlier 20th century and expropriation of their properties, everything, you can see that there was poison that was released through the Protestant movement. Number three, clergy versus laity. One aspect of the DNA of Rome which Protestants embrace generally and even put on steroids is the issue of a tiny professional priestly caste or clergy which acts as mediator between a holy God and unholy people. So the Protestant tendency is manifested in these two terms or you know things that show it number one seven point I mean three point one special priestly training in hidden knowledge to be known only by those who went through the seminary or theological institution only them know it hidden knowledge isn't it what the gnostics were doing then some of them were taken outside the bible by professors who didn't believe in the virgin birth who didn't believe in the in the in the humanity of yeshua or his divinity and they were to begin to teach people things and the professionals will take those things and teach it to the people with our heart. 3.3. .3, elevated altars for the clergy to stay, often having thrones on the altars. You see that almost at least 70% of Protestant denominations today you see elevated altar. And then 3.3. .3, a theater-like environment. The people are like those who come to a theater. In the UK, if you go to a theater, you buy a box of popcorn. You're eating and watching. You came to be entertained. So the today, the typical Protestant sanctuary is a theater. A tiny professional clergy goes to do some acting for one hour or two hours. The people have come to watch a performance. Men and brethren, 
Yeshua came to inaugurate a new priestly paradigm distinct from the Old Testament. We are told by 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which were in time past not a people, but are now the people of Elohim, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. In Yeshua's mind, he came to break down the middle of partition between clergy and laity so that everybody body born again has a call and then through a process we now have identified as teach here teach train equip activate release the church of jesus should be producing manpower from within the brethren who are processed from believers to disciples friends of yeshua sons of elohim priests after the order of melchizedek who go on reproducing after kind according to second timothy chapter 2 verse 2 but the Protestant movement has fostered that priest laity syndrome. And so some people can be in church for 10, 15 years. They don't know their spiritual gifts. They don't know their calling. They don't know the purpose of the Lord. They just come to church as rituals. Number four, rebellion, individualism, and divisiveness. It is necessary to state that the DNA of Rome also manifested in the Protestant movement in terms that can be regarded as retribution. Just as Luther rebelled from Rome, so also the rebellion became a standard fare in the movement, based on dreams, visions, fancy uh, ideas, emotional stirrings. People rebel against authority of those they are under to start whatever they want, expecting Elohim to rubber stamp it for them. And this made it almost impossible for Protestants to agree together on almost any issue. Very few. In some places, the only agreement is salvation is by grace through faith. Every other thing. Everybody is focused on their own version of truth. They hold on to that version and they don't go to say, what does the Bible say? It is what they think that the Bible says. So men and brethren, Protestants cling to what founders of their denominations interpreted from the word. So you see somebody today clinging to Luther or Calvin or this or that theologian 500 years ago. I remember going to meet somebody, I think it was a Baptist minister or so. You know what? I was, um, somebody was introducing us. And as we stretch a hand, he says, I am a Calvinistic Baptist. <laughs> the man already put a signboard upon himself. So this is my corner. You got to know it. He wasn't interested in relationship based on the Lord and the blood. Men and brethren, what is the outcome? Is the outcome of what was said about Israel in the book of Judges? Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That is the description of Protestantism today. Everyone can take his own theology, develop it, talk about it. And the rise of social media has put it on steroids. There's no more standard. It's now relative. It's now relative. What do you want? What do you think? That is what it becomes for you. As if there is no judge. There's no day we're going to come before the judgment seat of Yeshua. Number five, calls where human leaders take the place of Yeshua Jesus. Right from the early days of the Reformation, leaders tended to loom so large that their followers saw them as demigods in a sense. That situation has now exploded into a vast number of cults built around charismatic leaders and their ideas. People flock to such people as solution providers, you know, focusing on the miracles, the blessings, and breakthrough they project themselves as capable of giving to people. In the process, many Christians go to church, in quotes, as it were, not to encounter the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, but rather to encounter the man of God, the woman of God to whom they offer unwavering loyalty. They do not test the spirit. They do not check the fruit, in the beer in terms of life. You know what? The result is a tendency to create posters, flyers, commercials, whose star is not Yeshua, but rather the human leaders and ministries and churches. So there's so much projection into your face, into your psyche of people, poster, banner, billboard, 
his people. Come to this man. Come to this man. He can heal you. He can do this to you. Where is Jesus? Nowhere. Is a man and maybe his wife together. Their faces are staring at you. You turn left, they are staring. You turn right, they are staring. You turn right. It's psych ops, psychological operation to subdue people so that in dreams, in vision, every, all their life is wrapped around that. Men and brethren, Yeshua said in the book of John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. But people are drawing all men to themselves. It's called... Most Pentecostal ministries today are cults. The people don't know the truth that sets free. They know what the man of God said. They believe on his promises. They recite it. That's what they quote. That's what they recite. They don't know the Bible. And of course, they don't relate with others. They relate to themselves only. Neither do they pray for others. Men and brethren, number six, prioritization of church growth over kingdom growth. That's the ABC syndrome. Across the Protestant landscape, the thing, the in thing is to church growth at all costs. What is strong individualism around human builders, the ABC syndrome is prevalent, and that is attendance, crowd, building. They go into on certain holidays and cash. It's all about money. Follow the money trail. It's all about money. And men and brethren, mammon is thus given a seat on the high altar to which people bow and so seed not to get their financial returns. Men and brethren, we need to look at Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Whoever will build, you can build on sand, you can build on rock. The rock is the word. Sand is opinion of man. Number seven, worship is compromised and, and corrupted. Humans are created to have personal relationship with Elohim hinged on through worship. That's what Revelation 4.11 says, Thou worthy, O Lord, to receive all glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure they are and were created. What has Protestantism done? It has changed the narrative in a subtle way. People flock to a church with the wrong motive to use God to get what they want, not to worship. So people go to church because there are many men there. You can get a husband. There are many women there. You can get a wife. There are many people there. You can network so that you can get business opportunities. People go to church. You see, motives matter. The reason why you do what you do matters. So as church attracts such crowd and retain them through advertising and public relations, they project their infidelity to Yeshua and ally the church at Sadis, which was said in the book of Revelation 3, 1 to 3, a name that they lived, but it was actually dead. And Yeshua rebuked them. Number eight, normalization of apostasies, heresies, errors, and the pseudo kingdom, the pseudo gospel. With all that has been shared here, it is easy to see that the Protestant movement has become a hotbed of producing and distributing all kinds of other Gospels, with each denomination built around the words of founders or, or, or interpretations of Scripture rather than the Scriptures themselves. The raft of apostasies, heresies, errors, and the pseudo-Gospel that has emerged and which we started to talk about in this course and which we are also going to talk about this week all of them, go and check, they are mainly from the Protestant movement, not from Rome. Rome's own is clear. But the point is that while Protestants point accusing fingers at Rome, the other four fingers are pointing there. So you see that Protestantism today is nothing than a hotbed of apostasies and heresies and errors and the pseudo gospel. There's no more standard. There's no more scripture. It is what you think. So everybody... It's like the days, as we said before, of the judges. And no king in Israel. Everybody thinking, doing whatever he wants. So what is the summary? You know, there are many other things. Worldliness is now normalized, number nine, and the protestant movement. Worldliness is been thrown, is now embraced. Sobriety thrown out of the window. 
So it's the church of the world seeking to be known, recognized, loved by the world. Then number 10, points of contact. Um, abused. People do all kinds of things in the name of points of contact. And people have now made them idols. There are people who can no longer pray, for instance, except the anointing oil is applied. Because they believe that it has a magical power. Anointing oil is of the Lord. It's right and proper. But when you misuse it, when point of contact displaces faith in Yeshua, when it displaces trust in the King of Kings, it's now an object of idolatry. So, so many things have gone wrong in the Protestant movement. And to what matters, number 11, there is a subtle disinclination to study the Bible like the saints at Berea who studied to see whether this is so. Like we told you here, every time we share the Bible, please go and check the, check the passages, check them, chew on it, and know whether it's true or not. So what is the summary? Simple. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of Elohim. As Rome was mystery Babylon, so is Protestantism, the child of mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. In other words, harlots will come out of the mother harlot. If you don't explore these truths, you will be in error, thinking you are going to the end of the age, only to wake up to discover You've shot an own goal against yourself. One of the top three ministers worldwide went to Africa and told them something strange. He spoke of his being in a dream and he saw the last day and people were marching towards the pearly gates. Yeshua was standing and if people's life were right, he would smile and angels would come and take them to a cross. And if people's life were wrong, were not right, he would frown. And demons will come and take them to the lake of fire. And this man, according to that story, he said, was swaggering. He was one, he's one of the top greatest ministers in this generation. Going, well, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. As he was going, he said, as he was coming closer, Yeshua began to shake his head, frown. He said, cold sweat broke out in the dream. He woke up on the vision. The Lord told him, I'm giving you a second chance. He thought he was going to make it. He was crashing out. Brothers and sisters, eternity is too precious. Eternity should not be toyed with. While we are alive, let's check up our belief system. Let's check up our practices, our liturgies. Let's check up and see what is it about mystery Babylon that is in our system so that we can renounce them, we can reject them, we can repent of them, we can turn around in repentance and have the mercy of the Lord and be who he wants us to be so that our lives are free of apostasies, of heresies, of errors and the pseudo gospel. We're going to look at some of them again this week, but I want to say this to you. The Lord is gracious. He loves us. That's why he's speaking to us this way. It is not to condemn us. It is to convict us by his spirit so that we can make sure Brothers and sisters, you might lose everything on earth, don't lose eternity. You might, and don't ever think that every way, listen, every road leads to Rome, it is said, but not all roads lead to the kingdom. So what are you on? What has become normalized in you? When you were starting it, the law said, you know, not, no, no, don't. Are you able to snuff out the voice of Holy Spirit? And you are doing it, I'm thinking that it doesn't matter. You know what is happening? That's blindfolded. And this is a radical thing. This is not about pointing finger at anybody. Everyone must answer for himself. What is it in me that is mystery Babylon? What is it in me that is out of the way? Brothers and sisters, by way of assignment, number one, please summarize what you learned from each of the 11 points we mentioned today. Two, 
in what way can the protestant movement to be said to be a manifestation of mystery babylon three what will you do with this lesson brothers and sisters the lord is calling all of us me number one is is there anything any way i've given room for any manifestation of mystery babylon the lord said to us go and discover your foundations go and repent of anything that is not of the lord but be open to holy spirit and to the word holy spirit and the word you will discover everything that doesn't please the father we love you and we are preaching from the place of that love you can call it tough love but it is love as we're speaking to you we're speaking to ourselves so it's not like you and us are excluded check up whatever way so that the lord says come out of babylon so we can be pure and without spot and wrinkle on that day as he said that's why he gave the he's given the power of his word ephesians 5 26 27 that the church will be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing ready as the omega church for the, bri for the bridegroom who will soon appear. Let's have a sense of timing. The time is at hand. The coming of the Lord is close by. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just ask you to have your way. Help all of us to take the truth in and give it space to do the work and that we will be transformed and transitioned and delivered and perfected by your grace in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching. And we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook, Monday, all the way to Sunday, every day, by about 10.30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same of Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George, Monday to Friday, uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace, uh, Friday to Sunday. And then in the evening of Sunday, we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6, after 6, another one up to 7. So please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website, www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want. You can also, if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class, you can go to www.kingdomboostclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it. You can also subscribe to our channels. This YouTube, gsom.tv and we also have a Telegram channel, gsom media. You can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of Yeshua, Jesus, is empowered with truth. Remember, it is the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm. Absolutely free of charge. Have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.